my name is Carol. I'm a sophomore astrophysics major here at Wellesley. Today you'll be hearing a talk by Professor James Fatat, who's been teaching in the physics department here for three years. Last fall I had the pleasure of taking his first year seminar, which is called Einstein and the Invisible Universe. And there's a lot of invisible universe out there. <laughs> Being able to observe and study these invisible particles helps inform us and develop a deeper understanding of the cosmos we live in. To give you some background, James started his educational career at Brown, where he was a physics undergrad, and then he moved on to Harvard, where he was um, an astronomy graduate student. He got his PhD there. Right now, he's working on two projects. First one is called Apollo, which stands for the Apache Point Observatory Lunar Laser Raging Operation, which is basically measuring the Earth-Moon distance very, very accurately on the order of millimeters, which is absurd. He's also a part of DRIFT, which stands for Directional Recoil Information from Trails, which is basically dark matter detection, which is so cool. Uh, so join me in welcoming James to the stage. Thank you, Carol. Can everybody hear me OK? OK, good. That's the most important part. It'd be a long talk if you couldn't hear anything. So. Um, Thanks for that warm introduction, Carol. Again, my name is James Batat, and I was hoping to use our time today to talk about how you detect the invisible, right? So Carol mentioned that some of the work I do is on dark matter detection, and these are particles in the cosmos that are just not visible to our eyes and ears. But there's a lot of other things out there that are invisible, and we'll talk about how you detect the invisible. But before we get into that, um, I, you know, I think I want to make some comments about what it means to do physics at a liberal arts college. Um, and so this is, I often, when I teach intro physics, I start with quotes out of this book because it's, it's a great book. If you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. Go out and grab it right now. I have my copy right here. Um, but this is one of the great quotes out of this book. The day I went into physics class, it was death. And I think that the way physics is often taught, it's not hard to imagine why this quote came about, right? Because um, it, it's often this sort of cold abstraction of nature. It's often memorize these formulas without a deeper understanding of the bigger picture questions. Um, so let me read a few lines out of this book from the, the main character in this book, describing her first experience in a college physics class. He put the ball on a steep groove slide and let it run down to the bottom. Then he started talking about let A equal acceleration and let T equal time. And suddenly he was scribbling letters and numbers and equal signs all over the blackboard. And my mind went dead. Okay, so there you go. And then later, you know, it's important to understand that she wasn't bad at physics. I may have made a straight A in physics, but I was panic struck. Physics made me sick the whole time I learned it. What I couldn't stand was the shrinking everything into letters and numbers. Okay, so she was very good at physics. She got an A in physics, but the way it was presented was just sort of horrific, right? Um, I think that the thing to keep in mind is there's a huge difference between learning physics in the classroom as a sort of this mechanics of you know multiplication and vector multiplication and integration and why we do physics because we're, we're doing physics to address big big picture questions in the universe right? what are the origins of the universe how does nature work what are the underlying mathematical formalisms that can describe the physical universe um, and we do I think a, a fairly good job of that here I hope <laughs> um, but our goal is basically um, to integrate the liberal arts and the physics uh, to integrate the humanities and the physics and to, to bring interdisciplinary work to the world of physics to address big picture questions. So the, the kind of impression of physics that we try to bring about here is stand back, I'm doing science. It's this, in, it's this sort of engaging enterprise where we're drawing on different areas um, of education, not just mathematics and not just sort of the high school level understanding of physics. Okay? And here's a great example. This is a, um, a project that, was, um, that MIT was part of um, but it was a collaboration between several institutions where they built a robot that could do different things. And the second you look at this, this object that's moving around, it assembled itself and then moved around. You can tell that this is interdisciplinary work, right? You have, somebody has to know, in, on the team has to know something about building a robot, right? Somebody on the team has to know something about origami and paper folding, right? You can, this is clearly inspired by, from paper folding. There's a lot of tasks that this object, that this robot can solve this is all the same thing. It reforms itself into different shapes depending on the task it wants to address. But it's the same object. It can swim. It can carry things. It can dig. It can climb. 
can carry twice its weight. Okay? But th this is just one of the many examples of the types of, of, uh, the types of things that physicists and engineers are trying to address. And often what you find is that the interesting questions in the sciences now are very much interdisciplinary. And we need to draw on the talents of people from different fields to unite those into a, a common solution. Okay? So this thing, I think, is, is sort of fascinating. Right? So this is how physics was done in 1911. Okay? So the Solvay conferences um, is a series of conferences that ongoing to today, where it's, it's by invitation only. And it's the top names in the, in the field of a, a specific field. It changes from time to time. And they invite the top names in the field. So what do you guys notice about the people in attendance at this <laughs> conference? <laughs> yeah, they're all, almost all male. And yeah, so there's, there's one woman in here. Okay. Does anybody know who that woman is? Marie Curie. Marie Curie. So Marie Curie has the notable distinction of being the only person, not woman, the only person to have won a Nobel Prize in two sciences, chemistry and physics. Okay, so she was invited. In fact, she won a Nobel Prize in this year. But it looks like in order to attend this conference, you have to have a mustache <laughs> and a suit, in, unless you're Marie Curie. So I guess if you win two Nobel Prizes, you're exempt from that <laughs> requirement. But this was, you know, you can look at this picture and say, well, that was a long time ago. That was over 100 years ago. Things are certainly different now. Okay, well, so maybe that's true, maybe it's not. So here is, we'll talk a little bit about the Centennial Solvay Conference, which came in 2011, 100 years after the first one. There's no photo from that conference because the conference upholds the policy of confidentiality. So you don't see a schedule or list of attendees. Nobody knows who was invited. Um, but we do, in the modern era, have other ways of finding out what happened at that conference. So Twitter, we, through Twitter, we found out that there were, in fact, two women invited to this conference. Okay? So Lisa Randall is a very prominent string theorist at Harvard. Um, she's a top name in the field of theoretical physics. And she noted that it seems that the ratio of X to Y chromosomes hasn't changed in 100 years. Okay, so either that means um, there were still one woman, and I think it was 25 men, or um, in fact it was two women, but the total number of participants doubled. Okay, so the ratio hasn't changed. So we have the XY ratio is 1.09 in both 1911 and 2011. And notice that if you have equal participation of men and women, that ratio should be three. Okay, and you can work that out yourself if you'd like. Um, and here's the math challenge for the day, all right? Show that the ratio of X to Y chromosomes is equal to two times the number of women plus men over the number of men. Okay, there's your math challenge if you'd like. And you have to convince yourself that if you double the number of women and you double the number of women plus men, then the ratio of X and Y doesn't change. Right? So there's, there's your challenge. <laughs> I'm, I'm only teasing, you don't have to do it. Um, okay, so we do have some pictures from the Solvay Conference. This is the most recent Solvay Conference from 2014, okay? And if you go through, if you just scan, you can see that the ratio of men to women is, is very high, right? We're still not anywhere close to 50% participation. Okay, and if you want, you can count the number. It's six women out of 62. So that ratio, which should be three, is 1.2, all right? So we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. And, you know, remember, we're, wor we're working in a field where we need interdisciplinary knowledge, we need creativity, and we need to include the whole population. And right now we're very far from that ideal. Okay. All right. That conference, though, um, e each year, and each time they have the conference, which is every three years, they pick a topic and they focus on that topic. Okay. And the, f the first picture I showed you in 1911, it was quanta and I think it was photons and quanta, something like that. So they're trying to sort out quantum mechanics in 1911. Here, uh, the modern interests are really more on astrophysics and cosmology. And the reason for that is we're sort of in this crisis in physics and, and astronomy. So the astronomers, nice people that they are, have gone out and observed galaxies and clusters of galaxies, and they've revealed that the vast majority of the universe is what we, think, what we call dark matter. Okay? We don't know what dark matter is. So then they say, hey, physicists, what the heck is dark matter? Go figure that out. And then they go and observe the universe, and they find out that the galaxies are moving apart faster and faster, that the universe expansion is accelerating, which, which physicists thought was not going to happen. So then they say, physicists, go figure that one out too. So we have these two gigantic puzzles in, in fundamental physics, fundamental issues. We do not know. It's not even a, like a minor quantitative disagreement between theory and experiment. We have huge gulfs between our understanding of physics and our observations. So you might call that a crisis. A lot of people call that a crisis in physics. So we need to solve this crisis. Okay? So now we're going to talk about um, the invisible part of the universe and how, we, how do you go about detecting the invisible part of the universe with a hope of solving some of these crises in physics. Okay? 
So everybody put out your hand. Can you guys feel it? Can you feel something going through your hands? I heard dark matter. There is dark matter. There's dark matter in this room streaming through your hand right now. And you would be forgiven for not detecting it, not feeling it, because we can't feel it. But millions of particles per second are going through your hand right now. Okay? And right now, you're either sitting there thinking, whoa, that's, cra that's amazing, that's pretty impressive. Or you're thinking, who the hell hired this guy? <laughs> he's, he's crazy. He belongs in the loony bin, telling me that invisible particles are going through my hand at a rate of a million times a second. Or you can put your hands down now. It's OK. Um, you can't see them with your eyes, and you can't feel them as they pass through your body. So somehow, they're invisible, both to, to two of our main um, senses. But they're there, as far as we know. And when I tell people this, it, it's a hard thing to swallow, okay? because there's a lot of ifs when we talk about dark matter. If this, if that, maybe this, maybe that. But I want to convince you that the idea of having invisible particles pass through your body undetected is actually very well founded. And we have lots of, like, we have direct evidence, direct knowledge that this is actually happening all the time. Okay? So we'll talk about two specific particles that we know for sure are passing through your body right now. These are not hypothetical. These are actually happening right now. Okay? And we want to talk about how you know something is happening. How do you see something? What it means to see. Okay? So you can walk outside. When you walk outside of Collins and you go sort of that way, you'll see this tree in front of Green Hall. Right? So you can see that tree with your eyes. No problem. We're not going to argue whether or not a tree exists there. Well, I, I'm not going to argue about whether or not there's a tree there. You can also see things if your eye has a little bit of help. Right? Things that you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise. So these are cells from an onion skin. Right, which you wouldn't necessarily be able to see with the, with the bare eye. But if you ate it with an optical microscope, you can still use light and see cells in the skin of an onion. Okay? Then if you use other tools, you can see even finer details. So we've gone down basically a factor of 10 in the size scale. And now we're looking, does anybody know what this is actually? What this object is? Out of curious. Crayfish, OK. It's not, but that's a good guess. Sorry? A dust mite. OK, that's another good guess. There are a lot of images like this of dust mites. This is a picture of the third leg of a millipede, <laughs> the end tip of the third leg of a millipede. And the amazing thing, I mean, look at the detail that you're seeing on these little sensors on the body of the millipede, all of this detail um, on the little end of the foot of a millipede. Now, this image was not brought to us by light. Okay, So we're, see we're certainly seeing something here, but we're not seeing it in the way that we're used to saying seeing. We're not using photons here. The way this image was acquired was by shooting beams of electrons at the target and looking at what scatters back. And from, from that um, electron as a probe, we get a finer um, scale of resolution. We can see more detail if we have a finer probe. Okay? So now we have to start questioning, like, what does it mean to see? Because here we're, not, we're using our eyes to see a grayscale image of an electron pattern. But really, the thing that was doing the probing here was not light, was not seeing. It was electrons. Okay? So now we have to be a little more careful in what we say see, because we're not using our eyes here to see um, the, the millipede. We're using electrons. Okay? So here's, we can go even deeper, and we can see individual atoms. So here's a little movie about how you see and manipulate atoms. So each one of these dots is an atom, right? It's actually a molecule, but a two atom molecule. And this has the Guinness Book of World Record for smallest video. <laughs> Scientists can be funny and creative too. I think you get the idea, <laughs> right? That you can manipulate, you can manipulate atoms and see atoms. So, incidentally, that was made with something called a scanning tunneling electron microscope that uses an idea of quantum tunneling to measure basically the heights of atoms. We're talking about atomic scales now, so that's 
uh, one to 10 angstroms, so um, say a billionth of a meter. So very, very small scale. You can manipulate particles and sense their, uh, their structure. But that certainly wasn't done with somebody's eyes looking through an optical microscope. So now we need to maybe revise our vision of C and, and use the word detect instead. So we're not gonna, we're gonna move away from optical seeing and we're just gonna talk about detecting. So now the pick question is how do you detect things that your eyes can't see? Specifically, how do you detect particles, fundamental particles, particles that are not made up of other particles? So in that movie of Boy and His Atom, they were looking at atoms. Atoms are made of electrons and neutrons and protons. The neutrons and protons themselves are sub, uh, have substructure called quarks. We're talking about, when we talk about particles from now on, I'm going to be talking about those fundamental particles, the quarks and the electrons. So I asked my friends, my colleagues, my neighbors, what do you think of when you hear the word particles? And here's the word cloud of things that they think about. So they hear that you hear dust a lot, you hear electron, you hear atom, nucleus, flake, neutron, pebble, proton, quark. So particle means a lot of different things to different people. In the world of particle physics, particle really means fundamental particles that have no substructure. They have no physical extent. They're point-like particles. They, you can't measure them with a yardstick. You, you can't see them in any of the techniques we've talked about. We need new ways to detect these particles. And there's a sort of periodic table of fundamental particles in physics. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can lay it out in this way. Each one of these particles is, um, has no, is not made up of anything else. It's a fundamental particle. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these right now. But you can make a sort of a periodic table of the fundamental particles, and you can make a humorous version of the same thing. So if you know Roz Chass, she's, she does a lot of uh, New, York, uh, New Yorker cartoons. So some of the names of fundamental particles are a little bit absurd, even the real ones. So she made up a few not real ones. And my challenge to you is, can you find the real ones? <laughs> and can you distinguish them from the ones that she invented? Right? So, so we have the poserino, okay? and we have the slepton. All right? So hands up if you think the poserino is a real particle. Hands up if you think the slepton is a real particle. OK, all right. How about, um, well, happy, sleepy doc, those are probably uh, easy giveaways. But how about um, the squark? Any takers for real particle? A couple takers? Yeah, OK. So slepton and squark are real, like these are things that physicists talk about. Those are real names for real particles. They're hypothetical particles, but they're in the literature as um, candidates for particles. The poserino is not one of those. <laughs> Neither is the sleeves on, the cheesy, or the fake up. <laughs> All right. Um, but when you start hearing about sort of new ideas in fundamental physics, it, it sounds, a lot of it sounds really crazy, right? Like the idea that dark matter is streaming through your hand at a rate of a million particles a second, that sounds a little crazy. The idea that there could be what are called supersymmetric particles, a whole family of particles that haven't yet been detected, that sounds a little crazy. Um, so it's, it's sometimes hard to evaluate the difference between um, insane and creative. <laughs> okay. So um, let me focus now on three pieces, or, or really two categories in this, in this table. One is called the muon, and the other is called the neutrinos. There's three types, but we'll just talk about it as a single object, the neutrino. So we have nu for neutrino and the Greek letter mu for muon. Okay. And these are invisible particles to us. These are particles that are streaming through our bodies all the time, and you don't know that they're there. But for sure, we know these things exist, and for sure, we know they're going through your body. And I can tell you why we know they're going through your body and why we know they exist. Okay. So the challenge, again, is to detect these fundamental particles that have no physical extent. So if you really wanted to, t to find a muon, well, where do you go to get a muon? Well, it turns out you don't have to go anywhere. They come to you. And they come to you because in the upper atmosphere, you have cosmic rays, particles that are um, emitted often by the sun or solar winds. They strike our atmosphere, which to them looks like this thick slab of material. The, the incoming particles are coming at a very high speed. They collide with particles in the atmosphere, and they create a shower of particles that come out. And if you look at these red lines at the bottom, you'll see these muons coming down. And these muons can make it down to sea level. In fact, they can actually penetrate rock and go through mountains and so on. So if you're sitting at sea level, like we are now, approximately, these muons are being generated all the time in the atmosphere coming through your body at a rate of like one per minute through your thumbnail, approximately. Okay? So these things are all around us. You don't have to go and get muons. They're always there. Okay? But here's the challenge through the, the words of a young child, OK? We cannot see cosmic rays, hear cosmic rays, smell cosmic rays, taste cosmic rays, or catch cosmic rays. That's 
right. That's the challenge, OK? But, but watch this. So I, I, how, how old do you think she is? Six years, five years old, five years, four years old, right? She's not that old. But she's going to be detecting muons in her kitchen, OK? So here we go. Here's Samatha detecting muons in her kitchen. This, I think, is the hardest part of building the detector. Okay. I'll take the magnet and put it inside the plastic cup and outside the plastic cup. That's a creative way to hold the felt in the cup. Great. So that's good. It's a creative way. Health and safety always comes first. So all the stuff you can buy at CVS. So she's just built a particle detector, and she's going to show you the tracks of muons in her detector. So between the neon trail, we will use a flashlight to see the neon trail. Do you see those tracks that look almost like little cloudy straight line tracks? Those are muons going through her kitchen. OK, so she's built a detector that allows her to visualize previously invisible particles coming through her, her room. Okay? And we could have the same thing in here. We would be seeing the same, the same thing. Okay? So $10 builds you a muon detector. Okay? So muons are invisible, but the detection of muons is child's play, quite literally. Okay? <laughs> quite literally. And so how, how is this all working? Well, a muon has an electric charge. Okay? It has the same charge as an electron, minus charge, minus charge. And she's built this detector that has lots of atoms of isopropyl alcohol or molecules of alcohol floating around. So what do you think happens when a negative muon comes close to a negative electron? What happens? OK, they could repel each other, OK, because like charges repel. So they push on each other. What would happen if you push too hard on an electron that's bound to an atom? What happens to that electron if you push too hard on it? It gets kicked out of the electron. It gets kicked out of the atom. Okay, so this muon comes through, pushes very hard because it has very high energy. Pushes very hard on these electrons. The electrons are kicked out. It's called the technical terms ionization. Okay, so you create this track of ionization that follows the muon through the detector, and along those ionized electrons, you get the formation of clouds, very much like an airplane flying through the sky creates these contrails. So you can think of those muon tracks as contrails in her detector. Okay, all right. So the detection of muons, child's play. Okay? But muons do other things too. It, let, let's look back at this picture. So here we had created a muon, but the, this particular muon didn't make it to the ground. This particular muon fractured or decayed into other things. So muons are not long-lived particles like electrons are. Electrons will live forever. Muons only live for a few microseconds. And after a few microseconds, they break up. They decay into other particles. Okay? And in particular, the muon will decay into neutrinos and electrons or positrons. Okay? So the next level up in studying particles is to study this process, the decay process. And this is a little bit harder than what you can do in your kitchen. Okay? Um, so this is the next level of complexity. We want to study how a muon will decay into a neutrino, an antineutrino, and an electron. Okay? And we can do that. And we do that here at the college. And the technique that we use for that is we have this natural source of muons from the atmosphere. We have a scintillator, which is basically just a block of plastic that flashes and makes light every time a muon goes through. Okay? And the sensor that looks at those light, that looks at the light is called a photomultiplier tube. So we have a light flash and a light detector. And that's what you need to detect um, the lifetime of muons. And so in our class in Physics 310, which is the lab course um, for our, our physics majors, uh, we have the Muon Lifetime Lab. Now, the Muon Lifetime Lab was built by students at Wellesley College. I didn't make it, they made it. And, 
every student who has worked on the muon detector has been a sophomore, right? So this, this is a sort of, we're moving from five and six year olds in the kitchen to sophomores at the college, okay? But these students, have, actually one of, us, one of the students is here today, Raina is in the audience, um, they've uh, built and are developing the lab uh, infrastructure for this muon lifetime apparatus. So what happens, how do you measure the lifetime of the muon, how long it takes before the muon decays? You want to bring the muon to rest, so a muon will come into the plastic and stop. So the end of this dotted line is where the muon stops, and it just waits there, just sits there in the plastic until it decays. And when it decays, you get this electron come out. Remember, the muon becomes neutrinos and electrons. So you'll see a flash of light when the muon arrives, and then tick, 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 tick. Sometimes later you'll see a flash of light when the electron pops out. Okay? So that's what they built. They built this apparatus that has a plastic scintillator, and they put it in a light tight box, and on the underside they have these photon sensors, and then they have some readout electrons. Okay? And the goal is to measure the lifetime of the muon. So here's a sample track from that apparatus. So this is voltage versus time out of the, the photon sensor. So muon arrives, you get a flash of light, Sometime later, electron pops out, you get another flash of light. You measure that time difference, and you do that for, say, a thousand of these events, and you make a plot, number of decays as a function of that time difference between arrival and decay, and you get this characteristic exponential decay. The slope of that line tells you about the lifetime of the particle, and from this data set, we've measured that the lifetime of the particle is 2.2 microseconds, which is in agreement with the known values for the muon lifetime. Okay, so muon detection, child's play, in the kitchen. Muon lifetime measurements, quantitative analysis of the lifetime of the muon is sort of sophomore, junior level work at the college level, okay? Now we're moving up in complexity because you can do other things with muons, okay? You can use muons to probe non-destructively things that you can't get into yourself. So one thing you can't get into yourself is one of the great pyramids at Giza, okay? So for a long time, Tomb Raiders had exploded portions of the pyramids looking for treasure, looking for burial um, chambers. Uh, but there's a better way to do it. There's a nicer, safer way to do it that's not destructive. Okay, so here is the pyramid. I think this is the pyramid of Sephron. If there's an Egyptologist in the room, you, well, everybody in the room knows more about Egyptology than me. But if there's an Egyptologist in the room, please correct me if I'm wrong. But I think this is the pyramid of Sephron. And there is a known cavern down here and two entry points. And the question was, well, there, there's got to be some hidden chambers up there. There must be hidden chambers. So the, the, the grave robbers would just explode holes all over the place, sort of destructively looking for these chambers. The physicist said, well, we have the source of muons going through everywhere. Maybe we can use that to see if there is a chamber somewhere up above. And so they put a detector, a muon detector, down here in the known cavern. And they just counted the number of muons that came as a function of direction. How many muons came from above? How many muons came from the side? And how do you think that can be used to locate holes in the, in the pyramid? Any ideas? Something would change. Good. What, so what would change if there was a hole there in the pyramid? Well, OK, good. So if there's a hole, more of them will get through because there's less rock to block them. Okay, so you can make a prediction for how many muons you expect coming overhead if it was solid rock, and you can make a prediction for how many more you would get if there was a cavern. Okay, and you can compare your predictions with the observations. And they found that there was no, um, no evidence for a chamber, a hidden chamber, above their detector. Maybe something below, but nothing above. So um, the person that worked on this, the, the, the PI on the project was Louis Alvarez, um, and this was done in, in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Okay, and, and the point was at that point in time, nobody had used naturally occurring cosmic rays as sort of radiographic techniques to peer inside objects that you can't access. So that was really new at the time. Um, and the newspaper said, Louis Alvarez fails to find cavern in pyramids. And Louis Alvarez was pissed off by that. And he said, no, <laughs> I successfully confirmed that there are no caverns in the pyramid. Okay, so it was a null result, but a null result is not always a negative result. Okay. So this same technique that was developed in the 70s is used today, actually, currently, to monitor the inside of volcanoes. Volcanoes is another place where you don't want to go or you cannot go. Um, nuclear reactors that have melted down, also a place that's not safe to go. So you can use muon tomography to map the interior of places that are not safe to go. So this has been done. Um, here's a, um, the volcano, the Asama volcano in Japan has been mapped 
uh, the interior has been mapped using, using muons, how many muons are coming at each angle through, um, through the volcano. Um, and there's a paper that describes the results from 2007, and this is ongoing work monitoring Mount Etna, Mount Stromboli, and another mountain, another volcano in Italy whose name escapes me. But this is active work that's going on now. And you can see now we're talking about the scale has gone up one level. Now we're talking about on the order of 10 PhD physicists, right? So we started with a five-year-old, and then we have sophomores in college, five or six sophomores in college. Now we have 10 PhD physicists doing the next level of muon work, okay? All right, so muons can be child's play or they can be active areas of research, okay? Neutrinos we're gonna see is, are, are the next step up in complexity of, of invisible particles. So remember, nu, the Greek letter nu is our symbol for neutrino. Um, so we're gonna talk about a new particle, the, the neutrino, okay? So here's the author list from a neutrino detector. We've gone up in complexity from 10 PhD scientists to about 100, okay? And it's an international collaboration um, using a detector in Japan that I'll describe in a little more detail, okay? The collaboration's called a Super Kamio Kande collaboration. Okay, we're not gonna talk about the next level of complexity, but I wanna make sure that you understand there is one more level of complexity at least. This is a detector at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland where they collide particles together to look at the tracks that come out. This is a particular detector there called ATLAS. And this is the author list of the ATLAS collaboration. So quickly, count all the authors, ready, go. Page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine and a half, okay? So there's about 3,000 authors on this one detector, okay? So if you wanna detect the, the Higgs boson, which is one of the uh, particles that they detected, and I'm not gonna talk in detail about it, but that's even harder than the neutrino, and that takes 3,000 PhD scientists, okay? But if we get back to the neutrino, which only takes 100 PhD scientists to detect, the reason it's hard to detect is that unlike the muon, which interacts with alcohol in your kitchen, the neutrino will happily stream through a light year of lead unperturbed, okay? So it does not interact strongly at all. It, it's, it's the elusive particle. Okay, it took many decades to actually detect this thing. Okay. The interaction mechanism, right, when you have a neutrino coming close to an atom, can be drawn schematically in this way. Okay. You have a neutrino coming in and an electron coming in. And they interact somehow, and that somehow is the squiggly line that I'm not going to get into. And out comes an electron and a neutrino. Okay. That doesn't seem so complicated, but if you look closely, this neutrino doesn't stay a neutrino. This, it comes in as a neutrino and it comes out on the other side as a neutrino, but it converts to an electron. And the electron converts to a neutrino. So this is a rare process where a neutrino um, uh, interacts with an electron, but in a way that's very rare, where it actually converts to an electron and the electron converts to a neutrino. To the outside observer, it looks like a neutrino and electron come together and they scatter off each other but really there's something deeper happening there, and it's a very rare process. So in order to detect these things, you need a very large detector because it's a very rare occurrence, okay? So in Japan, the Super Kamio Kande um, detector, it's essentially a cylinder of water that's gigantic, okay? So their target is water, very pure water. It's 42 meters tall and about, uh, it's a similar diameter. It's 50,000 tons of water, and the photon sensors they have, remember we have these two PMTs looking for the muon signals. They have 11,000 of them, and each one of their PMTs is about this big. Ours are about this big, okay? So they have 11,000 gigantic photon sensors that line all of the walls, top, bottom, and sides of this, of this detector, okay? So here's a picture of the actual detector, um, and they're installing or checking on the PMTs, and then they fill the water and the people in the boat go around and make sure that row of PMTs are okay, and then they fill the boat again, uh, fill the water some more, and they check the next row of PMTs. So when you're doing neutrino detection, it's almost like it's a civil engineering project beyond a physics project, okay? So the complexity is, is very high. If this interaction happens, if the neutrino actually does hit the electron and kick out the electron, the electron moves so fast through the water that it moves faster than light does through water. So we, we, you might have heard, no, nothing goes faster than the speed of light, but you can slow light down if you make it go through a material. So light moving through water goes slower than light moving through air. And you can get an electron to move faster through water than light can move through water. And when that happens, you get a visual sonic boom, a, a visual boom, if you will. And that visual boom creates a ring of light. Okay? So the signature in this detector for a neutrino coming through 
is a ring of this sonic boom light. Okay? So they look and they try to reconstruct these rings of light in their detector. So here's an actual event from, from the Super Kamio Kande detector showing this ring of light. Okay? And they see something like 10 or so a day of these events. So they're very rare. Remember, this is a 50,000 ton detector full of water and they get about 10 events a day. Okay? Very rare. You're not going to do this in your kitchen. All right. Now, so this is how they see, um, this is how they can detect the invisible. Okay, so let's think about this a little bit, right? So here's a picture of a beautiful, of, you know, the sun on a beautiful day, right? We can see the sun, no problem. It's daytime, the sun's up. And here is a picture of the sun at night, right? Not a very interesting picture. We can't see the sun at night, and why can't we see the sun at night? It's behind the earth. The earth is in our way, okay? So that's exactly right. So the sun is a generator of light. We call those photons. And when we're on, when it's nighttime, and apparently we're floating in the ocean, but when it's nighttime for us, the Earth is in the way. The photons can't get through. The Earth is very good at blocking light. But the sun does not only make photons. The sun also makes neutrinos, a lot of neutrinos. In the core of the sun, when you have the nuclear reaction that power the sun, you get a huge flux of neutrinos that come out. Neutrinos can go through a light year of lead. They're very happy to go through the Earth. That's not a problem at all. So even at nighttime, Okay, this detector sitting in Japan, at nighttime, it can see the sun. Okay? So what I'm about to show you is my all-time favorite image in all of physics or astronomy. Okay? This is a picture of the sun taken at night in Japan okay? with neutrinos. So it's an image of the sun taken with neutrinos. No light involved here, just neutrinos. It took about 500 nights to get enough data to build up this image, right? because these are rare events. Um, but here is a beautiful picture of the sun imaged at night. So now you can say you've seen the sun at night. <laughs> All right. Good. So now let's think back to um, our periodic table. We've talked a little bit about some of the invisible particles here, the muon and the neutrinos. There's a whole other suite of hard-to-detect particles that we're not going to have the time to talk about. But maybe even more interesting than that is that current thinking in physics would say that this is an incomplete picture of all the particles in physics, that there's something more, that this picture expands out to include other types of particles. Remember we talked about the squarks and the sleptons and the spotinos. These tildes represent that whole family of particles that have yet to be detected, that lie outside of what we call the standard model of known particles. And a lot of the hunt that's going on now at the LHC, which has 3,000 authors on the author list, is to detect evidence for these particles. That's what's going on right now. That's one of the big picture questions in physics. Are these real? Are these, are these hypothetical particles real? Or are the theorists just drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak? Okay. So I, I have a few minutes left, and I'd like to just tell you a little bit about the work that I do on dark matter detection. Okay, so we've talked about now some invisible particles that are well-founded. We know they exist. But I also told you at the beginning that there's a million dark matter particles going through your hand, and we don't know if that's true or not. Okay, if, if the current models are correct, then that's true but we need to actually detect these particles in the laboratory. We haven't done that yet. And the reason that the dark matter puzzle is so important is if you look at the, the pie chart of the universe, this maps out the matter and energy content of the universe. The vast majority of the universe energy content is dark energy. This is the, the bizarre uh, substance that drives the acceleration of the universe. So that's a huge open question. What is the, this Pac-Man piece? What comprises that? The next biggest piece is dark matter. So the vast majority of matter in the universe is dark matter. It's not electrons, it's not protons, it's not muons, it's not neutrinos, it's not anything that we know and love. It's some fundamentally different particle, a particle we have not yet detected. That's this 25%. This is just a big unknown. This is a big unknown. Everything that we know and love, anything you can see when you look through a telescope, anything you've ever seen in Hubble Space Telescope images, those are all, that's all atomic matter. That's this tiny slice of the pie. And we have this huge missing knowledge. We know it's there, but we don't know what it is. Okay? So that's the crisis in physics. What the heck is this 25%? What the heck is this 69%? So I work on what the heck is this 25%? What is this dark matter, and how can we detect it? Okay? So here's a simulation of how the universe um, may have evolved. So it starts out fairly uniform. And then regions that were slightly overdense get more dense because gravity attracts more matter to it. And eventually you get these sort of clusters of objects, clusters of mass, that are the seeds for galaxies. And over time, I mean, this is, this is uh, billions of years here. So 
a tenth of a billion of years. So we're, we're counting in, hundred, in uh, 10 million years per tick here. Um, over time, you can see that these little knots in the cosmic web are intersecting and forming larger and larger structures that we now know are galaxies. Okay? But the matter that you're looking at here in the simulation is the dark matter. Okay? None of this is stars and gas. This is all just the dark matter. Okay? So all of the seeds for galaxies in the universe are de defined by the dark matter. So we really need to understand what this dark matter is. And if I skip forward to sort of the end result, you get this sort of network, this cosmic web of um, over-dense regions that are galaxies and clusters of galaxies and then voids in between like here. So we want to understand um, how this happened. So when you look at a picture of a galaxy, a spiral galaxy like this, you say, oh, that's a great, that's a very big galaxy. But in fact, that galaxy is like a, imagine it's like a penny sitting in a huge um, beach ball of dark matter, beach ball sized dark matter. So the dark matter is maybe 100 times, say, bigger than the size of the galaxy. And the dark matter is the big player, and we need to understand what the dark matter is. So it turns out that if you look into the night sky and you see the constellation Cygnus, the dark matter will appear to be coming from Cygnus, and that's uh, because of our, the, the sun is rotating through our galaxy, and you get a headwind of dark matter from the constellation Cygnus. So our experiments look for this dark matter flux from Cygnus. Now we have to do our experiments underground because there's a lot of particles that mimic dark matter um, that are much more prevalent than dark matter. And so if you just put a dark matter detector here, you would get a lot of events, but they wouldn't be dark matter events, they would be background. So we dig holes underground. It turns out that the way you make physicists really happy is give them a hole in the ground, <laughs> okay? <laughs> dig a hole in the ground about a quarter mile, half mile, one mile down below ground, and you can install these very intricate, complex detectors um, that are sensitive to these dark matter interactions. So remember, the boring particles like muon can penetrate a little bit through the Earth, but not all the way through the Earth. But the dark matter can go all the way down to your cavern below. So you use the Earth above your head as a shield, and then you build these detectors that look for anything else that can make it through. And that would be a dark matter particle. Okay. Usually you wear work clothes, but sometimes fancy people wear suits. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll, I'll close with just a couple words here. This is a photograph of the detector that we have running underground in a mine in England. It's a, 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 about a half mile underground. We have a, a gas-based detector that looks for the recoils or the trajectories of atoms that are struck by dark matter. So that's the way we sense dark matter, is by looking for these tracks in the detector. Um, and the goal for this project, as crazy as it sounds, is to do underground astronomy um, with dark matter. In the same way that you looked at the sun through the Earth using neutrinos, we're trying to map out the dark matter in the galaxy using these dark matter particles from observatories under the ground. So I'll leave you with that thought of underground astronomy using dark matter and as an invisible messenger of the universe. Thank you very much. You guys have questions? I'm very happy to answer as many as you have. <laughs> yeah. Does this dark matter article fascinate this article, or is it anything? Is is it a atom dark matter or something? Yeah. So the we start sort of simple in the theory, and the in the early days it was thought it's probably just a particle and it doesn't have any structure, it's not forming dark atoms or anything like that, just a particle. But as the searches for dark matter go on and dark matter has not been detected, theorists, theorists are sort of expanding that definition. Maybe dark matter does have some interior structure and um, you can have excited versions of dark matter that de-excite. Maybe there's something like a photon in the dark sector, a dark photon that allows sort of multiple dark matter particles to interact and interact with visible matter. So it, the, the true answer to your question, I think, is it's, it's an open question. We don't know the answer. It could be a simple particle, or it could be a more complex beast. Uh, what we do know is that dark matter clumps and clusters on the scale of galaxies. Okay, so it's not sort of a uniform sea that permeates the universe. So it has to be something that can clump, um, but we don't know. And even in the simple versions of dark matter, there's very little constraint on what the particle properties could be. So when we look for dark matter with this detector, 
we are looking for a range that's a, a mass of a particle that's one times the mass of a proton all the way up to a thousand times the mass of a proton. Right? It's sort of a paradise if you're a theorist because there are very few constraints and there's lots of opportunity to be creative in your theory construction. How do you get by? <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, that, it's, a, it's a very important question. So the community, because largely because of that, um, that pie chart that I showed, showing that how significant the dark matter is in terms of the content of the universe, the community of physicists, not just particle physicists. The 3,000? Yeah, 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 yes. Right, right. So an instrument like that is sort of a multi-use instrument where they're looking for not just dark matter but other, other things as well, right? So there's a lot of things that have already been successful and they've discovered many things in that apparatus already. Um, if you are just, if you're doing a project that's just looking for dark matter, um, then it's, you're sort of subject to the desires of the community, right? So every few years the community gets together and say, what are the priorities in particle physics? And what level does each of those priorities, what level of funding should each of those priorities get? And dark matter is still hot enough and interesting enough to the community to warrant the financial support. It may not always be that way. But right now, the community has deemed it interesting enough to get a slice of the funding pie. Like some really, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, it's tricky, too, because you, know, you run an experiment. And so far, the results of dark matter experiments have, have been, nope, didn't see anything but I can say that I didn't see anything better and better, right? So each experiment is a null result with more and more sensitivity. So you're sort of ruling out more and more of the possibilities, but there's no positive detection yet. And so the question is, you know, how long will the community tolerate that kind of, <laughs> that kind of result? And uh, that's, you know, that's, that's a human question rather than a science question. Yeah. I was you. just going to ask, how, what, what's driving the assumption that all of those particles are Like underground, you mean? Yeah. Um, it's not that they're high enough energy, but it, it's that we know that whatever dark matter is, it has to um, only feebly interact with regular matter. Otherwise, it would be easy to detect, and we would have already seen it. All right. So if it doesn't interact very strongly with matter, it's going to be making it through the Earth, no problem. And then the question is, you know, can we see, if we put a detector down there, can we actually see these particles? So we need large detectors, like that neutrino detector with large. We need large volumes, very sensitive instruments underground where we have the shielding. So I think that the idea that the particle interacts feebly with everything else is a sound idea. The question is, what the heck is this stuff? Right. One, and, one and then two, yeah. Yeah, that, so a good analogy would be like the neutrino, which has no finite extent and is almost massless, and the muon, which has no finite extent like the electron. So we can detect them through the effect they have on other material. But if they act very, if they interact very weakly, yeah. something. So then you need a large detector. So you need to, the way that you get more events is by giving more possibilities for interaction. That means more targets, a larger detector, and waiting longer. Right? So we, we talk about exposure, which is number of target particles and how long you waited. <laughs> and that drives the expected event rate. So it's sort of a waiting game and a design game. So one here and then. Uh, yeah, you said that um, you haven't found them yet, but that they cluster around galaxies. Does, yeah. that, mean, does that mean that the fact that they cluster around galaxies is a model? No, so that's, that's based on observation. So, he, so this is the, the puzzle that astronomers fed us was they looked at objects in galaxies, like stars and gas, as a function of how far they were from the center of the galaxy. They looked at how fast those objects were in orbit, what their speeds were. And they expected the speeds to decrease as you get further and further from the center of the galaxy, in the same way that planet speeds decrease as they get further and further from the sun. But what they found is that the, the speed was constant. No matter how far you got from the center of the galaxy, the speed was, was the same. And that's evidence that there's more mass than you can see visually. So it's a distributed mass throughout a galaxy. It's bound gravitationally to the galaxy. In fact, it is the galaxy, really. And then you have this sort of sprinkling of visible matter somewhere in there, which is what we call the galaxy.
but really the galaxy is this huge spherical mass of dark matter. So that's sort of observational evidence. Now, it doesn't tell us anything about what those particles are. Is it a, is it a lot of really small particles? Is it a few really big particles? Those would both be consistent with the observation. Yeah? So these um, particles are going through our body. Yes. Does that have an implication to uh, the development of diseases? The development of the? Diseases. Diseases. Ah, OK, yeah. So there, there is a paper by a dark matter physicist, a theorist, a woman at um, a University of Michigan, talking about dark matter interaction rates in the body with the idea that maybe dark matter could cause genetic mutations through the interactions with your DNA. The, you know, the interactions are rare, but you live for 100 years, say. Maybe that could have an impact. And what they find is that the interactions of dark matter with target, like the oxygen and the hydrogen in your body, um, it, it produces um, of recoils or, or events that are so low energy that it's not enough to ionize or to rip apart DNA. So uh, in terms of DNA mutations, um, they, the results from that paper that we're, we're, we're OK, we're safe. But there might be other implications as well. I mean, there's also work talking about the effect of dark matter on ice ages in, in the, the galaxy. It could have an impact on the sort of cycle of hot and cold climates throughout the galaxy. Um, but I, these are sort of, um, I, I would say at this point, open questions. But there probably are other environmental causes to disease that are much more substantial than the dark matter interactions in your body. I think I would leave it at that. <laughs> other questions? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So they they can their telescope. I call it a telescope because it can actually reconstruct the direction that the ring is somewhere, and the axis through that ring points back to where the neutrino was coming from, more or less. So every event they get, um, they can sort of orient a point on that plot. And so, yes, you know, uh, clearly the sun is moving over the course of the day, but they know where they were pointing, and then they can reconstruct in the sky um, night to night where that event should be. It's, this, it's the same detector, but basically, um, so they have a track in the lab frame. Like, here's your, here's your track. And then they can say, ah, where, you know, where is, how do I map this lab frame angle onto, say, the celestial sphere um, in a way that's consistent from tonight? So they basically can build up. It's almost like they're tracking the sun at some level. Like a telescope would track a source as it moves through the sky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it helps the cause. I mean, I think especially a show like Big Bang Theory that has a scientific consultant, so the science on that show is actually damn accurate. Okay, great. Yeah, great. there's a lot of examples where the science just makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> but in that particular show, it's especially good. In fact, you, if you watch it, you might have seen a show where they go to the roof of their building and they, they measure the distance to the moon lo using lunar ranging, which is exactly the work I do. And I was sitting there watching it, thinking, wow, they really they nailed it right on the head. This is exactly what it's like. Um, so I think it's, you know, people talk about the Big Bang Theory effect. So the number of physics and astrophysics majors nationwide is ramping up now. So we've seen at Wellesley about a factor of two increase over the last four or five years in the number of physics and astrophysics majors. And, you know, we like to think it's because of what we do, but it's happening at other schools as well, right? And so the question is, well, what's causing it? And there are theories that it's things like Big Bang Theory that are getting the sort of like role models for what it would be to have a career in physics or astronomy, right? Seen in the in the more public sphere. So I think it, it helps. Yeah. Did you have a question? Well, yeah. I, I, my chance goes along with that in a way, but I'm wondering as a middle school teacher, how do you how are we supposed to be encouraging the students to ask these questions so yeah. they know that they need to pursue these fields for the future? Do, do we give them belts in a classic right? <laughs> I, that is a, that's the million dollar question. You know, I have a six year old and a seven year old, and they're going through kindergarten and first grade right now, and I, I I'm not sure I'm seeing in the schools what I would love to be seeing, which is things like that. I think a lot of hands on activities, giving students room for exploration, having a curriculum that's not so prescribed from day one for all students to be the same, is probably a step in the right direction. 
I'm certainly not an expert on you know middle school and elementary school curricula, but it, it just seems like you know the way they learn in preschool, the, the way my kids learned in preschool was wonderful. They sort of flowered where it was, here's stuff in the room, go and explore, figure something out. There's a fix-it table where they would just take apart electronic equipment. There's a sand table where they would experience different feelings and um, look at different colors and interaction of light with materials. It was all exploration based. And, Maybe that doesn't work for all kids, but it worked really well for mine. And uh, it's somewhat different <laughs> when you enter kindergarten and first grade. And again, I don't have the experience for the, the higher grades yet, personal experience from, for my kids. But I think the extent to which you can carve out space for exploration for young children, they're inquisitive, man. They're going to figure out the questions themselves, certainly at this age. Say it again. If you're, where does human being come from? What would be the physicist do to answer the question? The question is where, like, if the kids ask you where do humans come from, what what does what does a physicist say? <laughs> um, you mean something different than evolution, or? Uh, Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I have a good, good answer to that. I think um, I would sort of cling to the evolution story. <laughs> um, I don't know. Do, if you have, do you have something specific that you're no, no, thinking? No, just in the matter or something. Ah. Um, yeah, not, nothing compelling from the field of particle physics that would sort of drive an alternative explanation for the origins of species. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.